talking to everybody here. And it should be obvious to you now, but by now, that the university is obviously very supportive and committed to this seminar, which has been organised by the USQ Multicultural Centre. In fact, the university is well recognised domestically and around the globe for the delivery of high quality academic programs, but also for our role in providing a supportive, safe, peaceful, respectful learning environment in which our students grow to reach their full potential. And we really do pride ourselves on our diversity and the role that we can play in promoting peace, harmony, respect for diversity, not only on campus, in, in all the learning contexts, but also the contribution that we can make to the community in that space. And my role is Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Students and Communities, and I have the great privilege of leading um, a division of staff and, and we're uh, responsible for many of the student support services that are linked directly to the key phases of the student learning journey. And apart from services related to recruitment and retention and enhancing the student experience, a key responsibility for me is building and supporting communities. And this includes, uh, we have many communities, but this includes our wonderful international student community. USQ has over 5,000 international students joining us from over 80 countries all around the globe. We have wonderful uh, multicultural communities, student communities. We of course have the work of the Multicultural Centre, Christoph and, and William have been instrumental in making sure this university is the first university in the country to have its own uh, multicultural <coughs> policy. And of course we have the most iconic event. This university has an event called Harmony Day where we bring together all of the multicultural communities uh, in the region. And we also have our multi-faith community, which includes the chaplaincy and the multi-faith centre. And the university does work hard to recognise the relevance of religion in the lives of many people. And the chaplaincy and multi-faith centre, which is led by Evan Reibold, good morning Evan, uh, provides support and support for staff and students who wish to integrate their spiritual life <coughs> with their academic and their endeavours. And chaplains from most of uh, the, wide, the widest uh, representation of faiths are involved in our multi-faith service. USQ has also provided an Islamic centre on its Toowoomba campus for Muslim students and staff. And the centre has been run by the Islamic Centre of Toowoomba, who are about to open the first Toowoomba Mosque and at the same time run the Toowoomba International Food Festival. And uh, I'd like to congratulate Professor Shah Jahan Khan, uh, who's here today, for his tenacity, uh, his drive, his commitment and energy to make that happen. And the opening ceremony for that is coming up very soon. Uh, from time to time I get asked uh, questions about the multi-faith centre and what does multi-faith mean. And I thought I'd just share with you what I think it means. Um, from my point of view, the multi-faith uh, meaning to, to me and the service that we provide is that we do recognise every faith in its own right. And that we respect that faith. And that we don't try to integrate or devalue any particular religion or alter the significance or meaning of that particular religion. And so the approach with the centre is really based on the equity dynamic of respecting diversity um, and celebrating the diversity and building that into the university setting. And it's that respect for culturally diverse ways of spirituality and religious understanding of life that should be embedded in our university culture. And that's very much what we strive for. And I think that message is really important and has relevance in connection to the purpose of this seminar and obviously the program features many different expressions of the presenters' experiences and, and their lived <coughs> faith lives. And it's these diverse interfaith encounters that form and build communities of awareness around peace, religious dialogue and culture. And as I say, these themes are, are instilled in, inside the university and I wanted to also emphasise the importance of our wonderful collaborations with a number of community and government organisations, including the Toowoomba Regional Council, the Catholic Diocese of Toowoomba, 
Islamic society in Toowoomba, the broader government agencies, the community, and religious leaders, and other educational institutes. And you'll hear from any of these organisations during the course of this seminar. And I certainly want to thank all of you for your involvement in, in those presentations. Before I officially open the seminar, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank the Multicultural Centre staff, Christoph and, and Boone, in their hard work in preparing and organising the seminar. Um, at this particular juncture, it would be remiss of me not to make special mention of Dr. Christoph Bartolovich, uh, the Director of the Multicultural Centre. Uh, many of you know Christoph is leaving the university shortly and heading into retirement. I wanted to publicly thank Chris for his efforts and contribution and his role and career at the University of Southern Queensland over the last 20 years. And his contributions and involvement have been thoroughly appreciated and he's had a wonderful career at USQ. So Chris May, I wish you good health and all the best for your retirement. <laughs> Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the University of Southern Queensland, I'd like to officially open the seminar on peace, interreligious dialogue and culture. And I wish you a wonderful experience over the next two days. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Vice Chancellor, for the official opening of this important seminar. And now I, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Wayne Driscoll, Executive Director of the University of Queensland, the State Government, uh, to lead us into the first very important session. Wayne, we are at Amdale University. Thank you, Christoph. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet, elders past and present. Quite an auspicious uh, day for, uh, for recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It's the sixth anniversary today of the National uh, Apology to the Stolen Generation. It doesn't seem like six years ago to me. I still remember welling up uh, during that, um, that uh, the apology that was given in Parliament House six years ago today. That, for me, marked a significant point in reconciliation uh, between uh, our First Nation people and other Australians. And I think the discussions over the next uh, couple of days uh, can learn a lot from the, the, the journey of reconciliation uh, that we've had over the last 200 plus years. Um, the wins and the losers of reconciliation. There's still a long way to go. Um, uh, my job is to, uh, to try and control I think three um, leaders in their own right and three very eminent people. Um, uh, I haven't met uh, two of them yet, although I'm sitting next to one. <laughs> uh, we're running a little bit behind, um, but if we go 15 minutes or so over, if that's okay, so Crystal, we might have to start uh, directly. Um, the first session we have three speakers. We have uh, Councillor Paul Antonio, the Mayor of the Regional Council. We have Dr. Lucas Maseri from the National University of Cordova, Argentina. Um, and we have uh, the most uh, Reverend Robert McGuffey, uh, the Bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Cordova. Uh, and welcome to you all. Um, and without any further ado, I'll hand over to uh, the Mayor of the Regional Council. Uh, thank you very much and it's a, it's a great honour to be here and to be a community leader in this wonderful city, in this wonderful region and also have the opportunity to say a few words today. Can I recognise uh, first of all the Jarrah and the Guidal people but also the Reverend, Most Reverend uh, Bishop Robert McGuckin, Alan Grummet, his wife who has turned up, and Mr Brian Shaw Martin, uh, Father Brian Sparksman, um, Bishop uh, William Morris, great to see you here, William, uh, to Bill, um, and also to those from the University of Southern Queensland, particularly from the Multicultural Centre, and all involved in today. So I said previously, previously, it's a great honour for me to have the opportunity, as leader of this broader community, to say a few words on a day like today. 
Tonight, I congratulate everyone on coming to, together today to explore the issues of uh, dialogue and between the various faiths and the cultural practices in relation to peace and harmony. This morning, it's my great pleasure to address you and to shed some light on our journey to become a model city of peace and harmony. And to look at the journey, you must first begin with our history. I guess the name Toowoomba is a little confusing. Uh, there are a number of uh, very clear directions as to where it came from. Only one of them can be true, and maybe none of them are true, but anyhow, I'll give them to you. Uh, there are those who believe it was named after a property in this area in the 1850s. Those who believe it's an Abri Aboriginal word meaning place where water sits, or place of melon, or place where reeds grow or possibly even burying space, or it was a term used for white men. We know, of course, that the traditional owners of the land of the Toowoomba region were the Gaibal and the Jarawa people. European settlement dates from 1840, with land used mainly for sheep and cattle grazing. Population was rather minimal until the 1860s, and growth took place in the late 1800s with land becoming used for cereal growing, for dairy farming, some timber milling, and in some places coal mining. In the early 1900s we saw the region expanded, particularly along the railway line, and it's very interesting that I've left a, a meeting this morning to be here uh, that was talking about a major project that will connect this region uh, to Melbourne and to Brisbane uh, by rail. More substantial Development took place post-war, with the population of the region growing from about 57,000 in 1933 to 70,000 in 1954, and continuing on that journey to where we have some 160,000 people calling the Toowoomba region home at this point in time. The area, area that I proudly lead now consists of one large city, eight rural towns, 45 villages, and 13,000 and might I say the second most productive agricultural region in Australia. We have enormous diversity of course in our, in our economic base. We have education and you all know that uh, education is a major part of who we are and, all, and always has been. So it's certainly been enhanced by the advent of the university. We have manufacturing, we have some of the best agricultural land in the world. We are and will continue to be and will grow into the future to be a major transport and mobile hub. We are a centre for health excellence and of course uh, we are facing mining in many areas at this point in time. <clears throat> there are many things to love about living in Toowoomba. Many people just simply love the picturesque parks, the easy climate of one of Australia's most beautiful cities. Others are lured by the wide open spaces or the beautiful Australian landscape. Personally, uh, when I drive through Toowoomba, the thing that had the profound effect on me is the beautiful streetscape and those beautiful trees. I come from a family with a multi-generational connection in this very area. Queensland, Toowoomba was just recently named Queensland's most family-friendly city. Why? It was the second year in a row. Because of the employment opportunities, because of the lower crime rates, because of access to education, access to health, and the general quality of life and the livability of this region. We all know that Australia is a young country and a very diverse country. Some seven million people have migrated to Australia since 1945 alone, and we treasure them all. Australia, at this point in time, we believe there are some 270 different ancestries. And we know that more than 5% of the people in our region speak a language other than English in their home. As Mayor, one of the most powerful and rewarding tasks I undertake is when people choose to become new Australian citizens. It's my role to conduct that ceremony. It's heartening to see how many good people from across the seas continue to want to call our great country home. <coughs> and our great region home. They've come here to enjoy what we all take for granted. 
As many of you know, Toowoomba is aptly named the Garden City. It's a beautiful environment in which, environment in which to live. Rich soils in, in many places, normally good rainfall. <clears throat> and each September we celebrate that great gift that we have by celebrating the Carnival of Flowers. The Carnival of Flowers began in those dark days post the Second World War to lift the spirits of this community and to build economic prosperity uh, in our region. And that's just what it's done. It's been continuous since then. It brings our community together and it provides for a wonderful community spirit. Last year, ladies and gentlemen, some 100,000 people turned out to watch that very parade. And that parade, parade, of course, includes some of our clearly multicultural diversity. And I think testament of what I think summarises this great place I've come to share with you today in that Toowoomba is a great community that cares about itself. And I'm delighted as the leader of this community to support our journey to become a model city of peace and harmony. And there are many steps in this journey towards a truly peaceful and inclusive community. We are fortunate to have the presence of multi-faith, multicultural centre, the Pure Land Learning Institute, and tremendous ecumenical cooperation between the Christian churches in our community, as well as, an, importantly, the, the Goodwill Committee, which has been formed from various representatives from across the community who are working hard towards this ever important goal of peace and harmony. I followed the journey of the Goodwill Committee very closely and, and providing ongoing support since I was elected as Mayor some two years ago and having previously served for four years as Deputy Mayor. The Committee was formed in 2012 and is progressing its commendable goal. It's made up of both community, business and faith leaders. It's not an easy task, ladies and gentlemen, and, but we are on a journey. But I do believe the goal has resonated well within our community. As a community leader in my region, I believe I must be part of leading the charge in preserving and treasuring the distinct features of this nation's diverse faith and cultures, and indeed, celebrate, celebrate their very presence in our community. But it's through education, cooperation and celebration that we create a foundation of religious harmony by allowing all faiths and religions to come together and coexist peacefully. <coughs> we begin, begin to build the road to a truly sustainable peace and harmony within our community. I strongly believe that Toowoomba's diversity of cultural and faith tradition, traditions is one of our greatest assets. And so much goodness can flow from living together harmoniously. There's no, no doubt that good decisions about life and how we treat others stem from good education. Former region has 32 primary schools, 18 <coughs> secondary schools, two tertiary centres, and education is one of our greatest assets. In this community, one third of the population is currently engaged in some level of formal education. The foundation for that diversity is built strongly on the presence of this major university. University of Southern Queensland, with something like 25,000 students across Australia and the world, and they're educated on-site and some of them in long-distance programs. I understand over 80 nationalities are represented in the students currently studying at the USQ. Our community is all the richer for the stories, the traditions and the cultures that these students bring. Therefore, naturally, the university is heavily involved in the, in the move towards making Toowoomba this model city of peace and harmony. The multi-faith forums organised by the committee, the Pure Land Learning's Multi-Faith and Multicultural Centre and the University of Southern Queensland Multicultural Centre are very well attended and are a great way to share fellowship amongst the different faiths. It's not everywhere that you can bring Christians and non-Christian traditions together to engage in mature, intelligent discussion about making this city a better place. As I mentioned earlier, I'm not surprised that the vision of making Toowoomba a model city of peace and harmony has been articulated. There is already so much goodwill happening naturally here and positively captured in this special community. 
While our environment is spectacular, our air is crisp, and the climate, temperatures, and scenery magnificent, it's the people who are the spine of our community. Several key community groups and organisations contribute to the remarkable cooperation, care, and pride that Toowoomba is increasingly known for. We at the Toowoomba Regional Council are proud to support initiatives to make Toowoomba a better, more harmonious place to live. I recognise Robert Garcia, our multicultural officer here, and other members of our staff who work hard in that area, represent council at a, a wide range of forums. But very importantly, recently, ladies and gentlemen, in fact, in the last year, we took a very conscious decision to declare Toowoomba a refugee welcome zone. A refugee welcome zone is a local government area, like our area, which has made a commitment in spirit to welcoming refugees to our community, upholding the human rights of refugees and demonstrating compassion for refugees and enhancing cultural and religious diversity in our community. This public commitment is also an acknowledgement of the tremendous contribution that refugees have made to Australian society in many fields, in many fields indeed. TRC, through its position, supports events like the annual Toowoomba Languages and Cultural Festival. The vision of the Toowoomba Cultural Festival is a celebration of the diversity of languages and cultures that exist within our region. There are many performances on those days. It is held in the beautiful Queen's Park on the edge of Toowoomba City Centre. And the festival brings colour, excitement to the city over a weekend in August. And we look forward to the program this coming year. We strongly support Harmony Day on the 21st of March. It's a day when we respect other people's culture. We respect those who call Australia home. From the traditional owners of this land to those who have come from many countries around the world. And by participating in Harmony Day, we can <coughs> learn and understand how all Australians of diverse backgrounds equally belong and equally enrich this culture. Tom? Uh, the Council has well established sister city relate, our sister city relationships, firstly with Takaski in Japan, <coughs> Paju in Korea, and New Zealand as well, Monganui. We are strongly looking forward, we're looking forward to increasing that relationship with other countries, and I guess we're particularly looking at China and India at this point in time. As a result of these relationships, Toowoomba hosts several delegations throughout the year by bringing school students here, we just entertained some the other day. We bring business people here, we bring international visitors to our city, and our community is richer for that experience. I firmly believe that by focusing on our young people, we will make change. With each new generation comes that opportunity. One of the ways I work towards acknowledging young people is through the Merrill Achievement Awards, where some young people who have clear disadvantages are able to be rewarded for the courage they show in getting through life. Through spreading positive messages and really tapping into their world, whether it be through social media or, any, or through sporting clubs or any other opportunity, all level of governments, the media, our faith traditions and educated community groups, we all have a role to play. Cooper is proud of its, where it stands up to say no to violence. And I today wear a badge that indicates that I am a, a white ribbon ambassador, which is very much in keeping with that. This is something that's driven from this community is part of what this community is all about. And it makes absolutely sure that people understand that this is a safe place to live. We're a very diverse and a very caring community. And we aim to promote fellowship and amicable relationships amongst people of all cultural and all linguistic backgrounds. We want to strive towards making Toowoomba a region of increasing inclusiveness, peaceful and tolerant society that honours and makes place for and contributes towards the goals of all those cultures in our region. <coughs> our Chamber of Commerce, our Police Citizens Youth Club, all those groups of people are very much inclined to be backing what we're trying to do. Ladies and gentlemen, I speak with great pride of my, my home, the Toowoomba region, but I with humility. We have begun a journey towards making Toowoomba 
a model city of peace and harmony. But we still have a long way to go. Can I quote the Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu? A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Ladies and gentlemen, we're on that journey. And as the leader of such a wonderful community, I'm pleased to be able to be with you today and share the joy, share the goodwill and the passion that exists in the Thunder region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor. Um, it's obvious that we are um, having this seminar in the best possible place in Australia to have a discussion about interreligious dialogue and peace and harmony. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, it's done the day and you know, the aspiration. It's fantastic.
solve this, uh, this conflict in a way, but there are some tragic conflicts. For example, sometimes upset uh, one community um, entails a future conflict between the previous community and the new community. And the synchronic is the, the conflict between the universal principle and the individual principle. When we try to um, apply policy for everyone, uh, it, it goes in conflict with the individual um, aims of people. So, trying to focus all those um, theories, I want to <clears throat> stress how interreligious and interfaith dialogues are useful for trying to find space, spaces of convergence in our uh, global and democratic societies. Um, Mariette says that even reason is not um, a non-contradictory concept. He says that uh, there is a function, a dimension of reason that is skeptical, but there is another dogmatic. So, when we believe in something, uh, we accept something as a dogma, but not only um, a religious, uh, religious people do that, but also non-religious people do that. When we believe that, we, we, some, we believe something, we accept something as a dogma. Uh, he is uh, based on uh, two applications of philosophers, German philosophers, Habermas, Jürgen Habermas, and Karl Tuchels, and he, they said that any dialogue, dialogue should be uh, involved in these three uh, presuppositions. Universal validity, validity of what we are trying to say, uh, capability of the participants, they should have reason, uh, reason or uh, the ability of speaking and understand, and the third is the openness to critical evaluation. And this is a hard one because when we accept something as a dogma, we don't want to question it. Uh, so we can see that how the conflicts appear in the very root of the dialogue. Another Norwegian uh, theory, um, Lerby, of your Lerby, says that we need to put apart the, the search of consensus and try to hear the other. It doesn't matter if we uh, disagree, but we need to accept the voice of the other. The polyphonies of the democracy are um, the best way of a health community. For reasons he criticized Habermas now for this um, search of consensus. If we made a dialogue, we, are, we don't need to get a consensus. We need to respect the other as a participant of the dialogue. For a reason I, I, I made this question, uh, why the interreligious inter dialogue should include atheist people? Because of this um, aspect that Larry mentioned. Uh, we need to go beyond this duality between us, religious, and them, non-religious. For the reason I, I, I mentioned the contradictions and the conflict, even in the people that says, I'm rational, I'm atheist, I don't have any problem uh, with this, but I don't want to be involved. Even, even sometimes, uh, as a philosopher, 70% uh, of my colleagues are atheists, and they are more zealous than the fanatic they criticize. So for a reason I think we um, should make an effort, even now it's a challenge, um, the interfaith dialogue, but I think we need to make this challenge bigger. bigger. Um, because we can find new convergences, we can try to find um, more spaces of dialogue that open um, this is of mutual respect and it's a way to avoid violence because when we stop speaking uh, we started to use other resources because we cannot do a, a negative piece 
in our global world, we are forced to interact all the time. <coughs> Uh, we was in the last. The Open Information Center is one of the main resources to build. I believe that. I believe that this is the only way or one of the best ways to improve uh, the foundation of the positive peace understood as equality, justice, uh, same of opportunities for everybody. So, for a reason, open the interfaith and interreligious dialogue uh, to the concept of um, positive peace and to um, the inclusion of the non religious people and the non religious view is uh, positive in this way. A lot to create spaces of convergence between different beliefs, establish a symbolic way of interaction as an alternative to violence or negative peace. Acknowledge human diversity and enhance mutual respect and contribute to the democratic lifestyle. In the same way, I believe that I, I was a member of biologic committees and I think uh, religious people should be included there. It's the, the only way to avoid this feeling of otherness is including and enhancing the dialogue. Thank you very much. Very much indeed. And uh, your chair is green because you've made up five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll leave questions and uh, discussion um, to after uh, uh, the bishops. Uh, oh, uh, I'll give you a few slides. Robert McGuffin. Bishop, uh, welcome. Thank you very much for your welcome. And, uh, And uh, thank you to uh, Lucas for your uh, discussion there, and uh, uh, muchas gracias for uh, Pope Francis to, to the world who is continuing this uh, very much by uh, the way in which he's uh, living, is demonstrating this. I was going to bring my uh, remote with me for... So that was the uh, topic that uh, I was asked to uh, endeavor to touch into. It's a little bit out of my... Uh, uh, zone that I'm usually in, I'm usually uh, perhaps reaching perhaps, but uh, my uh, teaching is more in, uh, in school, teaching at universities and school of law. But, uh, so, just to uh, give a bit of a context there, uh, Pope uh, John III, they were the years in which he was the, uh, the Pope, and uh, John Paul II had a, a much longer period of time in which uh, you can see that he, he was operating. Now, With, uh, with John the Twenty Third, when he was elected, he was, uh, I think, 76, 77, and I think they thought, oh, this guy is just going to be uh, knocked off the boat and he's going to be there for a little while. And uh, well, that wasn't, in fact, what, what happened, I think, with the working of the Spirit. He called, he, he made announcements about a few things. He wanted to uh, uh, perhaps revitalize the church. He called it, he said he'd like to call a, a Vatican Council of the whole church. He wanted to uh, change some of the laws of the church and uh, a number of other things like that. So it was a little bit of a shock to people. He didn't see the uh, council right through, which uh, ran, the council ran from 62 to 65, but he, he died in the middle of all that. But he really got the, uh, got the ball rolling with that. And in the Vatican documents, this was an important declaration uh, Nostre Aetate, talking about in our age, in our time, and it reflected on the church's attitude to non-Christian religions. Now, we might say, you know, 50 years ago, almost since then, and it talked about uh, this document, very uh, crucial to the whole thing. <coughs> and that's the, the first, just uh, in our time, in day by time, we're being drawn closer together, becoming stronger, her relationship to non-Christian religions, uh, promoting unity and love among uh, people, indeed among nations, uh, trying to have a look at what we have in common and draw us into fellowship. And some of these documents may well have been seen as ideals, but uh, as time has gone on, it really has been something which has uh, 
uh, being brought to reality, and it, and it happens uh, very much in, I think, in our part of the world than it does in, in, in some other places. And uh, Lucas mentioned about interreligious dialogue uh, taking in non uh, atheists and the like, too. Now, there is another area where you know, bishops and the like, we are called to engage with those people, but it, it sort of set us a slightly uh, separate aspect for all this. It's the language you have to see, it's sort of uh, hardly inclusive, although it does call the church uh, on Trima and calls the people sons of the church, but anyhow, all of us do it by prudence and love in witness to the faith, uh, promote good things, spiritual and moral, uh, socio-cultural values found among people. So it's not just saying, which is really quite a change. Uh, the church, perhaps uh, prior to Vatican II, might have had the aspect of we've got all the answers, and if anybody, everybody else just spotted us, everything would be fine. Well, I think it realised there was a lot of good values outside the church, and it's only having a look at the good values working together that, in fact, we all can uh, actually advance. That's not always easy to forget the past, and we don't really forget the past, I think, uh, and there have been, in this whole question of interreligious dialogue, uh, uh, there have been some hurts there, but it's saying, okay, these things have happened, let's see how we can uh, progress uh, from this point of time. There shouldn't be any discrimination in this between people, between uh, the question of human dignity and rights, uh, and it's an area which I've spoken on a number of times, the question of the rights of people. And it's all very well to say, I've got this right, and just right over the top of the rights of other people. And it's a, something we do in society, and we have to consider uh, the rights of other people, and we also have to consider, at times, what's the common good in all this? And, and so often, I suppose, in, in conflict, uh, situations where I suppose are adjudicated and things like that, parties uh, really can be pushing their rights and they don't see that they, they're not the individuals on their own. We live in society and it's the question of rights of other people is something that we really uh, need to be uh, considering. So, after the council it was decided that uh, Pope Paul VI, who I think was a, uh, uh, quite a, a very dynamic figure in this that's underplayed. But he, he saw this is really necessary. And he set up a special uh, department in the church and called it the Secretariat for Non Christians. Uh, that perhaps was the name was changed a little while later when John Paul II he named it the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. And uh, a number of people here uh, are involved in those dialogues on a, a local level, but often even at an international level of uh, meetings and people from uh, diocese of the Toowoomba area have been to Rome. Uh, uh, Brian, can you remember when it was a couple of years back? It said uh, four or five years back, a, a delegation leading. Was it the mayor of that time in two? I'm not quite sure. sure. Of that person now. Yeah. But it's sort of uh, meeting together, uh, trying to discuss uh, how uh, we can, in fact, uh, work together. Now, this the goals of this thing is to promote mutual understanding, respect for the other person, seeing what we can do uh, collaborating with Catholics and followers of other religious uh, traditions to encourage the study of religions and indeed to try and promote uh, people who really are and who can engage uh, with others in this very important work. John Paul II wrote a lot of things, and one of the ones he put, uh, the Holy Spirit in the life of the church and of the world. And I think, in fact, he uh, scared a few people by all this, and of course, it really overturned the situation whereby uh, the church thinking, oh, perhaps no salvation outside the church, was seeing the presence of the Holy Spirit in the lives of everybody, and uh, we can't con control that or limit it to a small amount there. And in his document there, he quoted a lot of things in the Vatican Council. All people of goodwill, uh, 
Grace comes to them, unseen ways. Let's talk about uh, Christ dying for all of us. But we ought to believe that the Holy Spirit, in a manner only known to God, offers to everyone the possibility of uh, being associated. And uh, it's, uh, sometimes it's interesting when we talk about God, we have so many limitations in saying, you know, oh, God can only do this and that. Well, once we start talking this, we're, we've created some fiction for ourselves, but not allowing and the omnipotence of God to be able to uh, goodness for all. Very much this di dialogue's a two-way uh, communication. It's not just saying, you know, this is what we've got and this is what you have to accept. It's sort of the respect and trying to work together, uh, listening to one another, speaking, listening, giving and receiving. Give witness to you, your own faith in the process of all that, uh, and an openness to the other. And it's, it's not a betrayal of your own mission of the church. And uh, we talk about uh, atheist zealots. Well, there's zealots within the churches too, I can tell you. And, uh, and there's zealots of Catholics, even within the Catholic Church. Very difficult to deal with zealots, whether they're believers or non believers. But uh, in the process of all this, uh, you're not betraying your own religion, you're in dialogue, you're trying to uh, indeed um, give the message that we're called upon to do. Some 25 years after Vatican II, uh, there was a document called Reflection and the Orientation of, of this to have a look at how uh, we are proceeding. And John Paul II in Assisi in 1986 said, he underlined the fundamental unity of the human race uh, in its origins, destiny, the role of the church should be a sign of unity. Uh, but the question of the whole significance of interreligious dialogue, at the same time, once again, uh, we don't give up our own, own mission in the process of uh, what we might, might be doing there. And the Pope gives explicit recognition to the uh, presence and to the operation of, of uh, the Holy Spirit in the lives of, of other traditions. <coughs> which I, I think maybe if this was said 50 or 60 years ago, uh, perhaps slightly uh, unheard of. Bishops have a role in playing this. This document deals with uh, uh, the role of bishops. Uh, and John Paul II says, He's mentioned on various occasions there should be, it must be, the service of peace between people. You're not doing it just for the sake of it. You're trying to uh, work towards the, the goal of, of peace and goodness. And the role, it says here, is very much direct to bishops. Interreligious dialogue thus has a place in the daily life of many Christian families. For this reason, two bishops, as teachers of the faith and shepherds of the people of God, must give it proper attention. And uh, I'm saying I'm delighted coming to uh, to remember that uh, the Archbishop Bishop uh, Morris and uh, what's been established here uh, it's a reality. Uh, it was a reality uh, to where I came from, but I would suggest in, in some parts of the, the church that, uh, that doesn't take place. Uh, I know in some international gatherings I've been, there's been sort of a, a great deal of uh, uh, caution about all this. This was a matter where we were talking about media, what you do in all this. You know, okay, you spread the, the gospel, you promote dialogue, ecumenical, interreligious, and, uh, and, and maybe the popes may well say this now too, also with, with, with atheists and, uh, and complete non believers in anything. Defending the principles that we have, uh, work uh, ethics, and a whole other thing, and moral issues that which we may be working. But in the whole process of this, why are we doing it? Building a society which respects the dignity of the human person and is attentive to the common good. Uh, the, the notion of common good, I don't believe, was very well accepted by uh, people who are so self-centered that uh, it's just me, what I want, how I want, and you know, I want it, and they sort of roll over uh, the question of where anybody else is. Well, that certainly is not the role of uh, any of the religious gatherings here uh, all the community in which we, we live in Toowoomba.
Well, hopefully, all of us are endeavouring to seek to build a society which is open to dialogue, respects the human person, and is attentive to the common good. I think uh, sometimes these things are presented as ideals and so far away from us, but I think on a practical level within Toowoomba, it is a reality and it, it, it does work and people are uh, working together. I know in any support that I may have given uh, in relation perhaps in relation to the, uh, the mosque in Toowoomba, I was criticised by a number of people and uh, so I don't know what I'm talking about. I talk about uh, we have religious freedom. We must respect the rights of other people. We live in a society where uh, freedom is paramount. Uh, maybe in other parts of the world this doesn't happen, but here it does happen. So we are involved in, in dialogue uh, with all the groups that are there. No doubt uh, in promoting the Holy Spirit, uh, John the 23rd, the Norgrand, the Second Vatican Council, both Pope John uh, the 23rd and John Paul II up for canonization in uh, the end of April. I'm invited to, to Rome for that. Uh, some of these things happen all very uh, quickly. I, 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 guess I shouldn't say too rapidly sometimes, but uh, whatever of those things. But anyhow, certainly I think uh, John the 23rd was someone who got the ball rolling, who actually moved the church uh, forward in this whole area. And the declaration of in our age of the Vatican Council uh, started things happening. After the Council, there were developments, especially in the teaching of uh, John Paul II, calling us to continue interreligious dialogue in our age. And I think it's happening in this place in 2014 uh, in Toowoomba, and I, I'm very thankful for the opportunity that, that, that I am in this place and that there has been established uh, within this community that works, I think, so well together. A lot more I could say, but maybe even some questions on that afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, So we've had uh, three speakers. Uh, unfortunately, the mayor has been able to stay with us. Um, those who have arrived since, uh, since, the, mayor, since the mayor's presentation, um, this presentation gave a great foundation, I think, for why we are having a seminar in Toowoomba. Uh, Toowoomba, is, you know, as the bishop has noted, has, has gone a significant way towards real uh, interreligious uh, dialogue, um, peace and harmony. Um, if the speakers uh, are okay, uh, I'll uh, open up uh, the floor to questions uh, or comments to either Lucas or to the bishop. I think you'd on us. <laughs> so there were three things that um, jumped out to me. The first was something you said about the dogma. Um, and I wondered whether or not, um, or both of you maybe might comment on the role of dogma um, uh, in a positive sense. Because sometimes I hear something which I think is quite misleading, which is something like spirituality or morality unites, dogma divides. Um, and although there's a truth in that, I wonder whether or not actually uh, dogma, in fact, rather like good canon law, which is, um, is actually a good thing, it can actually construct. And in the examples you gave from, particularly I think, well, from both uh, popes, where the interreligious dialogue is actually founded on a deeper reflection on the dogmas of the Catholic Church. Um, and maybe that's something that, we, that, that needs to be affirmed. The second thing it was, um, what I guess I would call uh, the reception of gifts. And I've been interested um, in the work that I've done ecumenically in, in what's now called receptive humanism, where we start from a position not of when we meet together of what uh, we might have in common or what we might concede to one another, but what are the gifts that others might have. So as an Anglican, what are the gifts that I am diminished unless I receive the gifts of others? And I'm wondering whether or not that actually, uh, maybe that was something I... I've heard from Lucas as well, is, is part of that uh, being in the open space that I can receive from my uh, Buddhist sister a gift that actually enriches me, which is maybe part of my own uh, tradition and culture, but uh, that adds to me and that therefore enriches us. So maybe that's a useful uh, thing. And the third thing on this day of um, 
sixth anniversary of apology. Um, I wondered whether Bishop, you might like to say a little bit more uh, with Lucas about the role of apology, um, because it seems to me that our Pope since um, uh, John twenty third have actually made some apologies, either very officially or in practice, and think particularly in relationship to the Jews, but perhaps also in relationship to Crusades and other elements. And whether or not this is actually an important thing for religious leaders, not just Christian, but others, Muslim and others, uh, to recognise the pain of the past, and that will actually release um, new energy um, for us to move forward. A few questions there. Uh... Jonathan. Uh, Dogma is an interesting, uh, sometimes people think a lot of things that, that come as stated are dogma. Uh, Pope having a look out the window this morning, oh, it's going to rain today. Well, that's not particularly dogma, because uh, you know, Italian and Creek, there are uh, certain dogmas. But, you know, we talk about the foundation uh, of Jesus saying, you know, uh, love God, love your neighbour as yourself and uh, it's, it talks about we actually show the love of God by loving our neighbour and of course, and it's meant to be a practical thing is how we put it into play and I think uh, sometimes some of the minute things about dogma can get a little lost I think and uh, sometimes it's written, written in fairly heavy theological language but I, I think needs to get down to the practical thing, you know, how does this affect me, what do I, what do, I do? Um, I'm not saying you're dismissive of, of dogma, so I mean, and, and sometimes I think things are bandied or forward as perhaps dogma, which really, which really are things, you know, uh, we talk so often that a lot of the church documents and other people might talk about this later on, talks about, you know, in time and place where we are. And some of these things have to be interpreted where we are, we don't know when that was said to. Uh, so in, in that regard, I, I think uh, I, I just, yeah, I just be careful. I'm, I'm not saying I, I don't particularly, I mean, it depends what we're talking about, where we are in relation to dogma, but I think it needs to be practically lived in the witness of it. It's really much more important sometimes than the saying of things. We can say things, and it's in the area of apology too, we can say things in relation to apology, yeah. but it, it needs to be action to follow to, to act, actually back up the apology. It's not much as giving the apology. The apology is a good thing, but if you continue to not change the behaviour, well, you're just wondering about, about all that. In relation to the, the day of sorry here, the, the there is established here the reconciliation action plan, and there are a lot of things sort of uh, working towards that. So uh, that's a wonderful thing too that Bishop Morris was involved in, in setting up. So there was an apology there, but there's some practical things happening as a result of it. And I think all those things are important. The, the question about uh, sexual abuse things, uh, sort of there will be apologies given in relate, relation to that have been, and sometimes the Royal Commission. Uh, did, uh, Bishop Morris, I think, maybe appearing there the next week or so. Uh, but it's, it's some of those things are looking at things in the past. Things have changed, but we, we want to make sure we really have changed and that, uh, and also that we've reached out to the people who have been hurt in this and we can do what we can to... Uh, some people have been so bad, badly damaged, it's sort of, <coughs> it's a general, can be a generational thing. That's a really difficult uh, thing. Maybe Lucas... I want to say something. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I I I'm completely agree with your opinion. I just want to underline some uh, points from my field. <laughs> um, I think uh, dogma is like a, a word with a or a concept with a very bad rep rep reputation in philosophy. But any theory has a dogma. And it's the when we need dogmas for living. For for reason, I agree with the bishop. Um, especially dogmas uh, sometimes are a way of the to the common good that you mentioned. Um, even there is a joke of a Polish writer Vitor Gombrowicz that says, "I cannot um, have a skeptical attitude and give change of ten dollars." I need to abandon for a while, be skeptical, in order to live my daily life. So 
um, in a way, I think this is important uh, to recognize that dogmas are useful, but um, sometimes we need another concept, a philosophical concept, that is called epoche. It means put apart my belief only for a while in order to accept that the other could be different. Not try to impose. I, I, I feel sometimes like, especially in, from the other part as being a, a, a face in a group of atheists, um, I feel like I need to accept their view to fit in. Uh, and, and I think if this, this, this epoche concept, this way of put apart my belief in order to listen your or um, use the values of respect and openness of my own belief in order to understand and listen the other are very important too. But dogmas are need, uh, we needed them for the daily life. Uh, I think uh, even the um, I, I, I see a different uh, a strength change in my country now with the, the new Pope uh, Francis, how people is trying to um, establish uh, links with different uh, faith and some people understood their dogmas as we cannot allow this. There was a, a, a mass in a um, few months ago um, in order to um, a kind of apology for the Holocaust. Um, it was in a uh, church and some Catholic zealots uh, start to pray aloud in order to stop the mass. So um, that, that was um, a problem. I think when dogmas do that, uh, we need to um, try to uh, balance with your uh, dimension of reason. Have a little doubt or respect for the other that could be different. Um, and you mentioned that what we have in common uh, and riches and w how uh, we have different, how we deal with different problems, uh, even in riches too. And I think, as uh, Bishop mentioned, um, apologies are a great symbolic um, step, but they are not enough. Uh, but I think in a, in a broad um, way, for example, some uh, act attitudes that uh, the new Pope is doing, they are having a very good reception in people that is not atheist, but is not a compromised uh, Christian or yeah, special Christian in my country. So I think those symbolic attitudes are very important, but yes, I agree they are not enough. Three, three great points to start the conversation. Um, another question or comment? Um, thank you very much, um, Bishop of the Lotus. Um, um, I, I think one of the proposals proposed by Yokas is um, engaging with uh, atheists or, or people who are not within the, necessarily within the religion, uh, religious uh, domain. Um, I, I think that is obvious because um, we are living in a society where people can choose to believe or not to believe. And, and for the common good, they have equal share in the community to contribute and, and probably to disturb as well if, if they want to do so. Um, like when we had this two of mosque news published in the newspaper, I received uh, congratulations from an agnostic. And you know, he said, I don't believe in any religion, but I feel that every religion should have a go if they want to have a go. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's very important issue probably. Uh, and it is more important when there is a uh, sort of dominant group of that existing society. Like in Australia, about 20% or so, uh, or more than that, has no faith at all. So um, and, and that makes it very, you know, uh, important segment of the, of the uh, population. Uh, now, if you go to another country where there's not as many, then maybe a, a different story. But when you have a significant proportion of the population belonging to certain category, it's not wise to keep them aside and forget about them, but take them on board and that might be the way to go. Thank you. Well, that's very interesting. May I add a few more here? And perhaps you'd like to um, 
ask you a question, Dr. Missouri. Um, is given the interesting thought you just mentioned about the internet interrelation dialogue. And other comment, can you hear me without this? Well, I thought I had a teacher voice. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'll just leave that now then. Um, yes, and other comment, it's very interesting about religion. Now, Dr. Uh, Misery, I just wonder how far we are on the way to the interactive interrelation dialogue in Australia, considering that uh, you talk about your country and you've been here for a while. It would be interesting to see how far we are from there. Um, I'm not sure if I can uh, judge that, but um, my only experience was um, here in Toowoomba uh, with the Multicultural Center, and I think it's really advanced. Uh, it's, uh, the, the, the dynamic of the group was amazing. I, I saw the openness uh, I was speaking about, and um, I think uh, Toowoomba should be proud of that. Um, I think the problem, in my view, <laughs> I have a little critic towards <laughs> the system, um, it should be broader. I, I mean, I, I'm not speaking about uh, that I, f I feel close to the group, but I think the repercussion is only as representative of different communities. Mm -hmm. I think um, that uh, those meetings should be um, trying to be <coughs> massive. The first reason I think uh, interreligious and interfaith dialogue and, and multi faith centers should include uh, non religious people because a non religious person is not a non believer. Uh, maybe some, someone searching for uh, his or her faith um, and they should be represent, uh, represented in order to um, get the attention of a broader community. For a reason I think, I, I found very interesting, very advanced, uh, I, fi I find the openness I was looking uh, for, but um, I would like to see more people listening, uh, non-specialists, non-scholars, listening and uh, questioning. I, 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 this is, is my, my point of view, but I think the, the, the activities are really advanced and open. It's my only criticism. As a philosopher, so I, cannot be, abide, I cannot avoid it. Should there be a religion of non-religions at all? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think and influence people has values that determine their life. Yes. Um, even some of them are quite similar to uh, mm -hmm. some uh, religious people, yes. but they they are forced to say no, I don't belong here. Mm -hmm. But the need of religion, I think, is a human need. Yes. I I I I witness that among uh, my colleagues. Um, even once I was working with them and they said, oh, you believe in God? Please leave this group. We cannot uh, stand <laughs> a believer here. Uh, we are not believers. And I said, yes, you are believers. You believe in pluralism. You believe in uh, respect. You believe in philosophy. You believe on the search or the quest of truth. So they said, okay, but because uh, I'm not sure if it's a human non-believer. Yeah. We believe in things. Mm -hmm. and even as philosophers, we believe that we are speaking with other people mm -hmm. and not, not with our image, projected image of people. This is not a dream. I believe I'm here uh, to listen to your, your question. And that's a belief. And as, uh, as those, we have many. And we have, as uh, Jonathan mentioned, a lot of points we have in common. So I think for the next centuries, probably, we need to work in that, but we need to establish the foundation of that now. Mm -hmm. I need to look for an term to atheists. Because <laughs> <laughs> an atheist in this room, and I'm sure there are one or a number, would probably be a bit nervous about putting their hand up at the moment. Um, but that's a great point. Any other uh, questions or comments from? I, uh, I wanted to get back to the discussion around dogma and poke into that a little bit more because, uh, and I, I do apologize for 
on the right. I am, um, but uh, I don't know. So, especially in interfaith engagements, we often speak of dogma as if it has four letters instead of five letters to the word. It's a, it's a terrible term almost, and it's a, and that dogma itself is a, is a block to respect or understanding. And uh, personally, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel I have the right. First of all, to tell somebody what their dogma should be or how they should engage with their dogma, which is what I often see happening. You know, well, you're too rigid on that. Can't you be more flexible? So, well, that's that's their that's their philosophy. That's their life. That's their development. Um, but also, from a personal standpoint, I like to know what people's standards are. Or I like to know what they see as their limits or their framework or their structure that guides and directs their life. And if I really want to engage with them, how do you engage with somebody who, who in essence doesn't have dog, who doesn't have something that they, they build their life around, that they see as an absolute? Do they, I mean, are they wishy-washy or are they, are they yet uncertain and still trying to explore it or something? Or perhaps I have a misconception of dogma, but I don't see it as, as a block. I see it as, as an important foundation for understanding one another. And then from there, you can begin to, to learn and together and grow. Uh, I, I see your point, Dr. Um, Brian. Uh, Brian. Yes. But you see, I'm the person who was attended Catholic school before I speak, before I learned Vietnamese, that's where I came from. So I attended Catholic school. And then after a year, you know, with all the teaching of religion and things like that, my, pa my parents moved to another town and I attended a, a, a Buddhist school. And then again, another set of religion put on me. I grew up without any religion at all. And I feel free to, uh, to take a straight all the good things from different religions mm -hmm. to form something like Dr. Misery just mentioned that, okay, that's not the foundation for me, but it is something that I can get from anyone. I'm just like a, slice, a, a clean slide, but I can absorb anything good from that. Mm -hmm. And that just no religion that we should not discount. Mm -hmm. sure, my sure. view. I absolutely agree. I, I, I don't see any contradiction in what you said and, and the, the use of or the acknowledgement of dogma in, in other religions. Yeah, I, yeah. Um, I think that's pretty good. Thank you for that. Uh, Richard, I think you're good. Oh, yeah. uh, thanks very much. Um, I wonder if I could take up a point that uh, Lucas made about negative and positive conceptions of peace, because I, I think that's very valuable. Um, and uh, there's a, a great passage in St. Augustine's City of God when he says the, the Roman Empire looked around at all the enemies it had defeated, saw no more enemies, and called it peace. So peace is basically <laughs> the devastation you see when you've defeated everyone else. Uh, and that's a wonderful example of a negative concept of peace. But, but as you rightly said, peace is something very positive. It's, it's a work, it's a commitment. And in terms of interreligious dialogue, that commitment is clearly based on the beliefs that, that people hold. And uh, uh, as you said, uh, there are many kinds of, of atheists, but uh, I think it is true to some degree, at least in the Anglo-Saxon culture, that for many atheists, peace can only be based on the absence of religion. When, when people stop believing in religion, then there can be peace. We think of the John Lennon song, Imagine. Imagine there'll be no religion, and then there'll be peace. So certainly there's a strong strand in, in our Anglo-Saxon culture to say that peace can only be based on absolute Whereas I think uh, for people committed to inter-religious dialogue, it's, it's our beliefs, for example, for me as a Christian, it's our beliefs in Jesus Christ as God become human, that is a basis for our commitment to peace. Uh, so I think there's a, a lot of rich connections there between the idea of peace uh, and religious beliefs of various kinds. Thank you. Yes, um, very interesting the remarks. I, um, I, would, I would like to um, 
reinterpret the phrase of John Lennon. Um, if, if we include um, the non-religion non people as religious or as, as someone that believes in something that we cannot categor categorize as easily as uh, a widespread religion like Catholicism, uh, Islam, or uh, Judaism, um, maybe the concept of religion or the religious dialogue uh, could be uh, avoided. It doesn't. It doesn't mean that religion is is uh, isn't there. I mean, if in a world that we can um, cooperate without violence and our faith is not questioned for uh, another believer or atheist, um, we don't need uh, differentiate religions. We can speak about humans. So I think. It's not uh, negative that we only need to recognize that uh, everyone has something to say in, in order to set the values that we want uh, to discuss in this dialogue to uh, enhance our communities. So for a reason I think as, um, as pluralistic or as, uh, as much pluralistic be those um, dialogues are better for society. And if Roman uh, should integrate more the enemies, uh, probably uh, they don't need to kill them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think sometimes um, uh, those um, violent events that happen um, are rooted in the ignorance of what is the other for me. Uh, I think. You have a point, but uh, it's not. I only wanted to stress that no religions uh, doesn't mean that we are not believing anymore. No? Mm -hmm. Marco, I was just thinking as you were talking, that doesn't sound too different from what the bishop was saying about paying it to and beyond. Uh, I'll be very brief. I, I was, in relation to dogma and what Lucas has talked about, uh, Raymond Penica has an expression. Uh, beliefs divide, faith unites. Mm. Um, and to put that in context of, of our atheist or whatever, but like, a, in other words, faith, I'm taking faith as a, um, a, a human reality. Whatever people's religious or non religious beliefs are, I don't, and therefore I actually think a, be, a better word is I know the Catholic Church uses in a religious dialogue, but I think myself a better word is in a faith dialogue because it recognised. And I also think it, that also brings, like, it's not, it, dogma and ideas and concepts, like obviously they're absolutely important, but they're not all there is to interreligious or interfaith dialogue. It's, it's a meeting of persons, not just a meeting of minds. Thank you. Uh, just on uh, John the 23rd, uh, wrote an encyclical, uh, Archim and Terrace, peace, peace on Earth, but in looking at the, the full title of that, it talks about establishing <coughs> universal peace in truth, justice, charity, and liberty. Now, isn't that dynamic? Really, it's a, it's a dynamic thing. It's not a negative thing. It's really listening, dialoguing, and, uh, and, and working through that. So, yeah. Some others may be touching that. Mm. Some of them are to hear. Some of the research done in recent times with regards to St. Teresa, who you're probably familiar with Teresa of the Dark Night of the Soul. Um, in research, say, as she was dying or getting towards the end of her life, there was um, a concept that she had lost a belief uh, in God, who of course of that, of that dark night. And, uh, whereas in Teresa in her writings, as has been, as has been reported in recent times, many of the people looking at it, was the fact that Teresa came to the point where she could see whether you were an atheist, whatever your belief, whatever your religion was, um, you were, you know, you were part of that voice of creation, and therefore God, the Spirit, spoke in some special way to every human being, and therefore the voice of those people, no matter who they were, was as important as the voice of any other person. And as in, in that final stages of a, of, a, of a life, she realised that you know her particular um, position in the context of being open to God and religion was as important as that person who had no religion because the voice 
was the same in all human beings. And we had to be open to each other to be able to hear that voice so that the voice of God was the voice of creation. William, uh, you, you wrapping up there? <laughs> More than tea takes over. But, uh, thank you very much, and I think if we give a, a, a warm uh, round of applause.